right, welcome back. This is episode number 43 of Calibrated with Scott. I'm Scott, of course, and today I am joined by the one, the only, Brian Berletic. How are you doing, Brian? I'm doing well. It's like almost 11 p.m., so if I look tired, that's the reason, that's the reason why, but it's, it's all yeah, good. Yeah, for those of you who don't know, Brian lives on the exact opposite side of the world from, up from me, so when we do these videos, it's always a challenge figuring out who's going to be up early or up late, um, and today, uh, Brian's up late, so uh, everybody go and follow his uh, YouTube channel, The New Atlas. He's a uh, great analyst for uh, multiple geopolitical events and conflicts. And he really gets the job done. Uh, go go check him out. Uh, but today, Brian, we have a plethora of new information to talk about. It's been a while since I've had you on. Uh, I wanted to go ahead and just start with the big thing, uh, the dam. I wanted to get your perspective on it, what you think occurred, and uh, what do you think it means for the future of the SMO? Well, and it's happening all within the context of Ukraine launching their offensive. I'm pretty sure that's what we're looking at. We're looking at them launching their offensive, and then suddenly the dam goes. Uh, they had a really bad day or two days, actually, of the, the initial offensive. Russia was wiping out, you know, um, I, I don't know if you could say dozens, but uh, I think it was I think it is dozens of uh, tanks, actual tanks, and then many more armored vehicles and hundreds and hundreds of sold, uh, Ukrainian soldiers killed or injured in this initial phase of the operation. It went really bad. Then a dam breaks, and that's what everyone's talking about. They're not talking about the bad start of the offensive. They're talking about this dam breaking uh, or being blown up. And it's it's interesting because at first they all blamed it on Russia, just like they do everything. Uh, Russia blew up Nord Stream which obviously they didn't, yeah. even if they admit that now. Uh, they they uh, crashed drones into the Kremlin themselves. They did all of these things. They're shooting at their own nuclear power plant that they're occupying. All of these ridiculous claims, now they're doing it with the dam. And uh, the last day or two, I was just looking at these different articles. And uh, Sky, I mean, anyone who's following us on Telegram is going to have seen people pointing these older articles out. So they're... There's this one from the Washington Post from December 2022 inside the Ukrainian counteroffensive that shocked Putin and reshaped the war. No, it didn't. Uh, but they were talking, they were citing people from the Ukrainian military talking about how, yes, we plan to blow up this specific dam that was blown up uh, just, just yeah. this week. And they were even shooting HIMARS, U.S. provided HIMARS at this dam. So then when you see these other articles where they're saying, uh, oh, this is a catastrophe, this is an environmental disaster, where were these people last year, late last year, when Ukraine was openly talking about blowing up this dam? Where where were they? Now, the the, the topic of dams, uh, both sides have blown up dams. For example, at the very beginning of the special military operation, Russia blew up a dam that was blocking off water to Crimea. That did not cause any flooding or anything like that. It just allowed fresh water to reach the civilian population of yeah. Crimea, who had been cut off for eight years by the regime in Kiev. Again, obviously a, a crime against humanity, uh, covered up or condoned by the West. Uh, there was a the Irpin River uh, uh, outside Kiev. That dam was blown by Ukraine, and they have uh, articles like um, from the Guardian. Ukraine's hero river helped save Kiev, but what now for its newly restored wetlands? And it's a it's a feel good story about how now they have these new wetlands, new wetlands, <laughs> and a, nat a nature preserve. You know, minus Weber's homes were lost. Uh, so I mean, this is what the Western media has been uh, reduced to: just increasingly absurd narratives that are spiraling down inside themselves. It's just uh, it's just a cascading effect because it just gets more and more. Ridiculous, and it's interesting because now there's this uh, BBC article from today, Ukraine Dam. What we know about the Nova Kakovka incident, and they're they're basically saying if you tally it up, this is worse for Russia than it is for Ukraine because uh, of the the nuclear power plant was depending on this this water supply to cool the react whatever reactors are still running, and uh, the canal that feeds fresh water to Crimea. Now that that could be in jeopardy. Gee, who who would whose interest would it be to cut Crimea off from fresh water again? I, I can't I do you do you know Scott? I can't tell. I mean probably it's, it's, the same people who have been doing it since 2014. 
exactly yeah. exactly exactly so that's yeah, why we so, are the dam yeah the the i think that the obviously the blame game is just the natural next step for the ukrainians um but i do wonder i i was i was trying to do the you know pros and cons for both sides and what i came up with was for the russians the only thing that it would have benefited them in is potentially reducing uh a ukrainian waterborne landing that would have just been uh, you know a distraction to the main offensive in the zaporozhia region and try to bring more guys down um that was the basically the only thing that i could think of um outside of that the next best thing uh was that um well no that was the only thing that for the, for the ukrainian side though it wipes out fortifications it wipes out minefields that are on the opposite side of the uh, you know the river um it forces the Russians to relocate all of their equipment out of that region. So now that whole area is just going to be kind of a gray zone. And it also creates a distraction for the offensive that's not going so great. Um, I think that those are the biggest things. Uh, did you have, do you have any, do you, I mean, I've, I've racked my brain about what Russia could be gaining from destroying the bridge. Yeah. I, I mean, the, that BBC article was trying to say that, well, the, the dam was also a bridge and that Russia was worried about Ukrainian troops crossing the bridge, which no, they wouldn't be. That's a, that's called a bottleneck. I mean, that's what you, that would be the best, exactly thing. what, that's exactly what you would want them to do yeah. is to just all try to cross one, one single bridge along the entire river and uh, just be demolished by your, your long range fire. So even the Western media is at a loss, uh, as inventive as they've been recently, they, they cannot come up with a reason. How, now, how this would benefit Russia. Now, do you think that the, the dam was actually blown? Because I've seen a lot of satellite imagery from about six days ago, and I'll put those up right now. Um, those, it, it shows exactly where the HIMARS had hit the dam on the road section, the part that kind of comes out and goes around. That is exactly where the uh, collapse of the dam began. And it was very slow and over days, and then it finally broke open on the on June sixth. So, do you think that it was intentionally destroyed uh, by one side or the other, or do you think it was just a coincidence in timing? I mean, the 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 biggest issue that I have with it being a coincidence is that the Ukrainians had been filling this reservoir past capacity for months this has not been a this is not a new development this has been happening for a while so i'd like to hear your thoughts on that well that's interesting and uh, i think that's what we have to do we have to resist uh, being like the western media and just jumping to some kind of ridiculous conclusion just wait i mean eventually the, the all the evidence will come out and a clear picture will evolve especially the way each side reacts to this if if it seems like Russia has put on the back foot because of this, then I mean, obviously they didn't. Do, why would they do that to themselves? Yeah. It doesn't make any sense. And if Ukraine was filling up the reservoir for you know for quite a while before this happens, I mean, then obviously they were planning something. And this this is something that both sides have been doing. There was a there was a much smaller river beyond the Dnieper when Russia was still in Kherson city. Yeah. Russia hit that dam and they widened it and it. It made bridging much more difficult. So that that was something that Russia did, and that and that uh, was preemptive to the Ukrainian counteroffensive, wasn't it? In Kherson, yeah, I mean it was around the time they were crossing the river and yeah. uh, starting. So that that was something that they did. So maybe, so maybe now this uh, one side or the other again, like as we were saying, when you tally it up, it really just does seem like it. it and only it just seems to benefit. I think Ukraine. the biggest thing though is, why would you voluntarily hurt Crimean water supply when that's been such an issue? And it was like one of the achievements of the SMO. I yes, mean, that's you're exactly. reducing it, and that I, I just I don't see the logic in that. And I also. I, what I was waiting for was to see if a Ukrainian operation follows this up, because in a week or a week and a half's time, when the water starts to go down, uh, if we see an operation by the Ukrainians in this region, we can assume that either they blew it and used it, or 
it, you know, the damn blue, and now they're delayed a week. And and I think that that's I think that that'll be interesting to see how they approach it, and especially if they go after the Zaporozhia nuclear power plant, I think that that will be the big indicator of wh- who blew the dam. Yeah, we we have to see exactly where the water goes and, yeah. and the effects of it, because there's modeling that's been done. And we've seen those on Telegram, but uh, what it actually does in reality is a, a totally different story. So yeah. again, I think oh, let's just wait and see. Uh, but that's what we can tell so far. The uh, the Russians had to evacuate off of the Kimburn split today too, because it's starting to all the water levels coming up. So there's a, there's a it's a, there's a, it's very dynamic down in that region now though. But I think it is not. Uh, it it seems Russia is reacting to it. Yeah, as, as if they were the ones that did it, why would yeah. they also be react? The only ones reacting to it. Yeah. So I mean, you. you yeah, it, it, the whole thing doesn't make sense. It's just another narrative that has been put together. Um, and speaking of narratives, uh, I wanted to talk to you about the recent Washington Post article that just came out discussing uh, the CIA's direct intelligence of a Ukrainian uh, sabotage plan on Nord Stream. Uh, I wanted to get your thoughts on this because uh, I have my own thoughts, but uh, you know, people are here to hear your thoughts. So go away. Well, the, the the article ends by talking about all of these horrible things that Ukraine's doing that the U.S. has kept saying, "Don't do that. Don't do this. Don't do that. Don't attack Russia in Russian territory. Stop killing journalists." But they keep doing it, and you know what? They keep getting weapons and money and unconditional support from the West. So. Are they really telling Ukraine not to do these things or are they encouraging them to do that? It's obvious they're encouraging them to do that. That is that is the game plan. This is what they've done in Syria, Libya. It's not a coincidence that they're doing it in Ukraine now. Uh, and and the whole Nord Stream story, I mean, the U.S. was so desperate to stop that. You, you could almost sense that they wanted to blow it up. You could almost sense it for years. They were so desperate to stop this. Yeah. And they they even said, we'll do anything to stop it. And then they did. They blew it up. Mm-hmm. Ukraine doing this. They're just and and this is the folly of these these uh, these client regimes that get installed into power who who somehow think they're special. They'll be the first client regime that actually fares well uh, by being a U.S. proxy. No, they're going to get thrown under the bus with this. Uh, the point that you made before the show when you you, you said you wanted to talk about this article is that um they're saying they knew about it. So why this is an attack on a NATO member. Germany is a NATO member. This was part of their pipeline. This was gonna, this was infrastructure for them to get cheap energy from Russia. You knew about an attack and you did nothing to stop it. You you even now admit you knew it was the Ukrainians who were going to do it. That's what you claim. And you did nothing to stop it. Not only that, but afterwards you continue giving these people who carried out attack on NATO on a NATO member, you continue to give them weapons to c- continue uh, perpetuating the, their dangerous posture. That And I, what I said, and as I always say, this is another illustration of how NATO is its own worst enemy. There is no one that is more dangerous to NATO than NATO itself. Yeah. Um, that whole, yeah, that whole article, we, we knew about it. We knew that Germany, I mean, the Nord Stream pipeline is probably the single most important infrastructure project that Germany has uh, because of how dependent its economy has been on cheap Russian energy. The second that goes away, even if the gas isn't flowing, the opportunity, I mean, that is a declaration of war. By I mean, if it happened to the U.S., we would be at war. If it happened to Russia, I mean, I guess they are at war technically, but, uh, you know, I, I I can't believe how cool the heads have been in in, the, in Moscow about all of that. Um, it just it it's just another narrative that's just crumbling. It's just lies stacked on top of other lies and trying to cover cover up other lies. So uh, yeah, I I, I I've well, been at a loss on that article and how it actually benefits the uh, <laughs> the West. Yeah, yeah, and they're because, standing. But yeah, well, I was, what I was going to say is does blowing up the Nord Stream pipelines, does that seem like a move made by someone who's in a strong position or someone who's desperate and weak? And that, I say it's desperation and it's weakness. That's what that means. They couldn't stop it. They cannot stop. They cannot even stop their own allies from wanting to work with their supposed adversaries. 
because they're weak. There is no reason to do business with the United States except that they're they'll threaten and kill you if you don't. That's yeah. the only that's the only reason anyone does business with the U.S. these days, especially Europe. And uh, you know that's why they blew up Nord Stream. It was not done because they're so strong and they're they're not gonna you know they're that's just the one last loose end for them to take care of. No, it's it's not. It's absolute desperation. Yeah. Um, and again. If if anybody doesn't believe this, the West, the West idea of events is that the Ukrainians went up there on a small little boat and did a deep sea dive. What was it, two hundred meters down, something like that? It's, it's a very deep. It's it's well beyond what what any normal dive. Like you can't recreationally go down there and dive and do no this. You have Not to be a professional close. diver with high level equipment, and it, the the rig that would be required to do this would have been very noticeable. Another aspect of Nord Stream, I know everybody's talked about it, but it was within NATO territorial waters. There is no way a Russian ship is going to be in that area and not be immediately noticed, especially after the beginning of the SMO. That's just not going to happen. So none of it makes sense. Uh, back over to another narrative, because that's all it seems like we get out of Ukraine these days is just uh, narratives. Um the U the Ukrainian counteroffensive that is occurring right now across most of the front. Uh, technically, I guess you could say Belgorod, even though those are just kind of raids and I think it's just a distraction. Um, but you have uh, active advances uh, recently around Solidar uh, from the from the north around Seversk. You have uh, advances around Bakhmut or attempted advances around Bakhmut. You have uh, attempted advances around Avdiivka. Uh, Ugladar, and then throughout the Zaporozhia front. And uh, we have not seen very much progress come out of these. Um, and I, I just wanted to get your uh, take on that. If we look at the the offensive during the fall, the last, the last big offensive that Ukraine organized and executed, in the very beginning, this is what they did. They were, they were probing for anywhere where they thought that would be the weakest point. Let's hit there. Uh, the problem is all of these places that you just mentioned, Russia has extensive defenses set up there. They've been setting them up for months. They're layered in nature. There's a security zone, and then there's the actual defensive positions, and they're layered, and they go back uh, in depth quite a bit. Uh, in Zaporozhye, I think they go all the way back to Crimea. So uh, just, just for an example, success for Ukraine, they would have to... And what we see them doing is they get these groups and they try to overwhelm a certain spot along the line of contact. And they're sending armored vehicles and troops at Russian defenses. And they're hoping to close that distance because they don't have an, any, any advantage in long range firepower. They have to cross this distance, uh, uh, endure heavy Russian fire. And then they got to get close enough to start inflicting losses on Russian forces. And, and what we've seen so far is they're unable to close that gap. And in certain areas, Russian, there was a, I think there was like a small village that that they that Ukraine temporarily took control of, and then they they were pushed back out again. Uh, but this is how Russia has set up their defenses. They've set it up specifically so they can fall back and just completely grind down the Ukrainian offensive. They, they're not going to do what Ukraine does, where they just stand and fight and lose huge amounts of men and equipment, or go on the offensive and lose huge amounts of men and equipment. That's what Ukraine's doing. This is what Russia is trying to avoid. So uh, this opening phase, they're looking for weak points, and then I think they're going to start pushing harder uh, to, to actually uh, make Russia start moving back in those layers of defenses. And they'll probably do that. But again, like like I've been saying for months now, Russia knows this. They prepared for it. This is how they've organized their defenses, specifically to do that, specifically to move back. What the Western media is going to try to do is make that look like, oh, look, Russia's losing while the offensive is working. And what people are forgetting is the long-term aspect of this. Once this offensive ends, wherever it ends on the map, Ukraine's military is going to de be depleted of manpower, equipment, and ammunition that NATO has no ability to, to replenish. They've, they've gone through this cycle twice now. They're not going to be able to build a, a third army for Ukraine. So wherever it ends, that's where it's going to end. And as you, you said before the show, you're saying, so if they even if they reach the, the, the coast, and then what? Where are they going? And 
did they do you think they actually destroyed all the Russian forces or are they now surrounded on three sides by Russian forces because the Navy is going to be in the sea uh, able in range and able to to target the, the those Ukrainian forces on the coast as well and and the Air Force also Russian military aviation which has by by the looks of it has had a complete free reign I mean it, it is almost looking like air superiority i've seen very little man pad usage um it looks like they're out i mean i haven't seen man pads in ukraine for on the afu side for a good long while now uh they're very sparse and uh even the air defense doesn't seem to be very capable of covering these forward advances uh so i i was I know that these are probes and I know that there's going to be a larger push eventually, but I was, I was expecting more from this. I was expecting, I, I, I posted uh, about a week ago or two weeks ago that, uh, you know, Russia is going to look like a punching bag for a couple of weeks here when this offensive starts, they're going to be backing up and they're, everybody's going to be upset about it. You know, if you're on the Russian side, um, because they particularly doom hard, but, uh, just wait because this is the, the the whole point of layered defense is that you bring you your enemy hits it and they slow down they hit the next level they slow down they hit the next level they stop and then you destroy them and they're not even i don't I, it doesn't even look like they're breaching into like the security zone and you know the the area that the russians probably expected to lose from these probes and i think that's yes. very telling of the situation yeah i i, I agree with that and uh, also just just look at uh, Kherson and Kharkov in the fall. Just just look at that. Where did that actually leave Ukraine? That left them worse off than before they started because they were they completely ran out of everything. They all all of the troops that NATO trained from 2014 onward, all dead or injured, gone, not even a factor, even according to the West themselves. And that's exactly what's going to happen at the end of this offensive. And you could even hear Western leaders saying, well, this is going to give them a better position because then they then they think that, well, we'll we'll grab this territory and then we'll go to the negotiation table. But Russia has no reason to go to the negotiation table because they know you're out. They know there's not a there's not another offensive coming. And all they have to do is be patient and, and start grinding down those forces and pushing them back as, as they have been since la the last offensive. I mean, it's just a, it's a very self-defeating process, but we've seen the West do this in, in Syria. They're still doing it in Syria. They were doing it in Afghanistan for two decades, Iraq, uh, Vietnam, uh, long before that. This is what they do. They get themselves into these these quagmires and there's no graceful way for them to, to get out. Yeah, it, 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 that is a really good example right there. Just quagmires everywhere. It's, we We just get ourselves way too deep in things we shouldn't even be in. Um, uh, uh, I was going to say, even if the Ukrainians were to have some success in this, wh why I, I, I never understood this thought of, well, we're not going to negotiate from a point of weakness, but they will. I've, 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 maybe it's just when you're a bully in the world and everybody is, you know, weaker than you, so you can force it on them, but that's not Russia. I don't know why th there's this idea that Putin is going to negotiate from some point of weakness unless there is absolutely no other option for him. It doesn't make sense to me, and I have no idea where that line of logic comes from. If you're not going to negotiate at a, from a point of weakness where the Ukrainians are right now, why would Russia? It doesn't make any yeah. sense. And, and, and one more thing I want to point out is no matter how successful this offensive is, it doesn't address any of the actual core issues that is that is causing Ukraine to lose this war. This is a war of attrition, and they're losing this because their military industrial capacity cannot match Russia. No matter what they do on the battlefield, they're not going to affect Russian military industrial output. Yeah. That continues to grow. Again, even according to the West, they admit that that, that is growing, and it's far beyond the, the capacity of the US and Europe combined. So no matter what they do, it's not it's not going to affect that aspect of the conflict. And Russia is just going to come back, whereas Ukraine cannot. They're going to expend all this uh, manpower and equipment, and they have no way to reconstitute it, reconstitute it, not anywhere near the level that they they had right before this offensive was launched. And even that was was very lackluster. They expected to have so many more tanks and artillery and artillery shells. And, uh, I, you know, it's hard to tell if they got everything that they wanted or not. 
it could have been some deception there, but it doesn't seem like it doesn't seem like they did. And then even what was sent, there were some pretty hard hits on these these ammo depots that Ukraine had. By, by, by people are forgetting what ha, what led up to this offensive was this massive missile and drone campaign across all of Ukraine by Russia, specifically to disrupt the the combat uh, potential of Ukrainian forces before the offensive. Which I mean, definitely happened. We saw hundreds of glide bomb attacks over the yeah, past week, which clouds. is forward staging. Yeah. 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 So yeah, that's it's a it's it's a it's a very tough situation for the Ukrainians that they're in right now. They I mean, you know, they're in a narrative hole and they're committed. So yeah, it's 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 not looking terribly good, but I think we all kind of had predicted that it wasn't going to be looking very good from the beginning. Uh I I have I, I posted a recent video where I had sort of dubbed this now the SMO2. Um and just in in sort of a joke way where, you know, I don't feel that this is following the same rules that the SMO did at the beginning of the conflict. I think that after the decision to mobilize was uh, made, basically SMO 1.5 started and they just had to download until March, you know, get all the mobilized ready, get their industrial capacity up to par, um, uh, their military industrial capacity up to par. And then uh, around March, April, the ROE in Ukraine changed and the goals of the SMO changed. Um, and this was kind of also coincided with the uh, Kremlin attack that occurred and the uh, cross-border raids into Belgorod. Um, I wanted your uh, ideas on the, uh, you know, this is just pure speculation and rumor, but the uh, Bundanov and the Zaluzhny uh, missing you know, uh, not to say that they're actually missing, but I think that a very important statement was made by Prigozhin where he said, uh, Zaluzhny was within range of our guns. We took a shot. We don't know if we got him. So just the fact that they are now targeting leadership is that, I mean, that is, do you agree that that's a change of pace? Do you, or do you think that they have, were targeting leadership since the beginning of the SMO? No, I think they I think they changed. And uh, I mean, they even said that that's what they're doing now. And uh, it's very obvious that they, they've, they've gotten much more aggressive. And this is what Russia was doing from the very beginning. This was the whole point. The whole point was to gradually escalate and to always keep options to escalate further uh, in their hand so that they had leverage. And they still do. They still have things that they can do. They haven't done yet. If they wanted to, they could. They could be much more aggressive with the leadership and with targets inside Kiev. They they haven't. Uh, although, I think I think we're I think we're yeah like going after the Patriots. Uh, well, they said they were going to do that, and so th there is a bit of an escalation, and they can escalate even further. And I think there are other things that they can do, and this is this is what they have to do to keep NATO from trying to escalate. Because if if NATO does something else. Russia has these options that they've kept in in reserve that they can still use. They could still do another mobilization if they wanted to. And uh, they could do multiple. They I, yeah, they could do multiple mobilizations. They don't want to because of the political pressure it has inside of Russia. Uh, and also because they want to keep that as an option, uh, you know, so that they have escalation dominance, which the West, again, admits that, that Russia has and they want to maintain that. So the being very patient, and I always tell people, look at, at the conflict in Syria, the U.S. proxy war in against the, the Syrian government and kind of a direct war in some ways because they're occupying eastern Syria. That, that was a, an example of Russia being very patient, helping their ally in Damascus, managing escalation, avoiding it spiraling out of control, and being extremely patient so that in the end, they they ultimately win. And they suffered a lot of humiliation, short-term humiliation. There were there were instances where Russian warplanes were downed by Turkey. And they swallowed their pride because they were thinking, you know, the best, the best revenge is long-term success. Winning this is the, going to be their, their form of revenge. And I think that's the same in Ukraine. They're looking at the big picture and they're looking long term. They're not looking to answer every single thing Ukraine does 
because uh, it doesn't it doesn't make sense and it'll put them at a at a, at a disadvantage ultimately if they, they just stick to their original plan be patient and think long term but uh i do agree that it does seem like they're they are they have escalated since the beginning of the the special military op- operation without doubt yeah i mean even putin's statement the other day where he just basically came out and said you know what we're targeting decision making centers we hit the G- gur building in kiev yes i mean that's yes. a that's a big deal that because there are a lot of high profile people that were you know could possibly be working in that building who knows if they're actually anybody there but you know that that is that building has been there the whole smo and yes. it hasn't been hit and they could they could have hit it at any could time have. so that so that's you know your question about the, were they trying to from the very beginning very clearly they they haven't because they could yeah. have at any time yeah yeah, yeah. so i uh, i've been i've been uh on that boat a little bit that that the whole thing has changed and now the actual goals of the smo have also changed where they're not worried about negotiating they're not worried about the what the west thinks anymore they've put all they 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 just are ignoring uh you know claims and accusations and everything and just going on their own way and then uh, and that this is going to end the way that they needed to, to end and not uh, in a way that makes everybody look happy and nice uh, which i think is what they were kind of going for in the beginning of the smo uh, they wanted, you know, Crimea, no NATO in, or no Ukraine in NATO and autonomy and protection for Donbass and Russian speaking peoples. And I think that that honestly, that was the best deal Ukraine could have got right there. And instead they went with this. And now, you know, I don't even know if there's going to be a Ukraine left They're They're openly talking about regime change. This is, yes. a, this is a completely different talking point now. Regime change. He was the whole time they were talking about like Zelensky being in charge. Zelensky's the president. We're not targeting Zelensky, and now they're like, we can't have this leadership anymore. That's that's yes. a major, major escalation that I just think nobody even really paid attention to. And I, I think this is an important lesson for the the world to learn from, especially everyone that's still in the West's camp, the U.S. camp, uh, Taiwan, for example. Just think about po- before 2014, uh, U- Ukraine was enjoying the best of both worlds. They had their relationship with Russia. They had their relationship with uh, Europe and the United States, and they were getting the best of both. Uh, and then from that point onward, after the U.S. overthrew their government, put this client regime into power, everything was spiraling downhill. They destroyed their economy. They cut themselves off irrationally from, from Russia. They were waging war on their own population. They had the Minsk agreement. That was the first off ramp that was offered to them. They refused to take. Imagine if they did that. They they would have all of their territory. Uh, okay, maybe not Crimea, but they would have everything else. They could have taken that. They refused. And then after the special military operation, just like you say, in the very beginning, they had a chance to to minimize it. They refused to. So now it just gets worse and worse. Every month that goes by, it's worse for Ukraine. And I don't understand why anyone would think at this point it's going to improve. When you look at where they started to where they are now, the nightmare that they're in, what makes them think that at any point now when, when they wake up, uh, they're going to be in a better position? I, than when they I, no I have this conversation with uh, some mm-hmm. of my friends who are on the more pro-Ukrainian side, and I'm talking to them and I'm like, the Ukrainians haven't done anything since Kharkov. Like not even that, even that that, was like that. Yeah. I mean, it was a small, I mean, a territory gain, but you did like, there was no accomplishment. There was no military accomplishment other than if your stated goal is removing the Russians at any cost, I guess that is part of it, but you're not really removing the Russians. You're just wasting your own capabilities for territory. Exactly. And I mean, it's a war of attrition and you just wasted your, your army. Yeah. And they're doing it right now. They, yes. If they would have stayed defensive uh, and used all of this equipment, uh, they probably could have extended this conflict much longer, um, which isn't necessarily a good thing. But I, there's just no point to what we're seeing in Zaporozhia right now. There's just it, it's just a narrative hole that they are in the bottom of and they have they've hit clay and they can't dig anymore. So now they have to go through with it. The spring offensive is now a summer offensive. They have they have the equipment, but they don't have enough of the equipment. You know, the statements are all over the place. Nobody really seems sure. Um, um, what I wanted to talk about uh, again, or you know, 
is the, I think we talked about it last time is the F-16s um, and not so much uh, their capabilities or anything. What I wanted to know is, is there anything left for the West to send after this? Because I, I, I went through long lists of weapon systems and what was available and outside of basically red line weapons like uh, ATACMs and stuff like that that can hit Moscow. Uh, I don't, I don't see what the West can send, and this F sixteen looks like the last desperate um, bid to make something happen in this war. I'm just curious to your thoughts on that. Uh, it's, it, this is hard to tell because they said they weren't going to send a lot of this stuff, and and they've sent every single last bit of it, except for the attackums, which uh, that they may still send attackums. So, uh, to be honest with you, the the storm shadow has a longer range than than the attackum so yeah what, whatever whatever the storms whatever the attackums was going to hit wait they wait, could wait, hit wait, with wait, the storm. wait i think the storm shadow they got was the export version oh okay so what, was, and then what is the range of that is that like 250 or something or yeah it's like, it's it's definitely less yeah but it, it doesn't matter. It was five. The yeah, the 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 the, the domestic version is, I think, it's five hundred. Yeah. Well, anyway, the the point is that is something that I think if I was Russia, I would just factor in the possibility that that could happen. Yeah. That they could end up with attackums. They could even end up with who knows cruise cruise missiles. Who knows what what the West is going to transfer to them, because they're they're desperate to keep this going. They said they weren't going to send all of these capabilities, and they have sent sent it. So I I think there really isn't any limit to what they'll do. We see these cross border raids. These are these are Nazis that are going across the border with U.S. weapons, Belgium weapons, Polish weapons. There's talk of Polish mercenaries involved. So that's getting really dangerous because they're not they're not even keeping it confined inside Ukraine, and they're pretending like. They told Kiev not to, and they did it anyway. Well, if if you cannot control Kiev, why why do you continue to send them weapons? That that's blatantly uh, a complicity. You're you're just complicit in that. So uh, it, it's hard to tell where this is going to go next. I I think it could go all the way up to and include the West going in on their own, setting up some sort of buffer zone in Western Ukraine. I've said this since the beginning. Of the conflict because that's what they did in Syria. And a lot of people didn't think that was going to happen, but they did. They created the pretext and they did it and they're still there. Uh, in the long term, though, I don't think it matters what they do. I don't think it matters what the West does because there's certain fundamentals, both in terms of waging war with Russia directly or indirectly, and also just the, the global vector sum of geopolitics, uh, the transition to multipolarism. There's the de-dollarization. That clock is always ticking away. So they're 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 in a no win situation, and uh, but I th I think they I think they will still continue to escalate until they they just can't they physically cannot escalate any further. Yeah, and I and I agree. Um, I I, I have two questions. I guess I'll ask this one. Uh, because it was your first point. Um, do you think I I've thought about this for a while? Do you do you think that there's a possibility that Russia offers? Poland, Romania, Hungary, uh, their historical territory within Ukraine as a sort of, you know, like, we good kind of thing. Uh, just because I think that that would fundamentally damage NATO. That, you know, them accepting the territory and, uh, you know, grabbing land would fundamentally hurt the nato alliance and, and and i mean potentially right um i've i've thought about it in that you might not want to give poland who is extremely ambitious in the european continent uh more people and territory but also the western part of ukraine doesn't really produce much so it's not like that big of a deal and i i just think if it could result in some sort of uh, communication between Poland and Russia that might be the best end to this whole situation. What What are your thoughts on that? Uh, it's, no, this is this is another area. There's a lot of possibilities. I think about it often. I have no idea. It's, it's just pure speculation on my part. 
when you really think about it, if if Russia is able to take and hold the the oil blasts that they've that they've taken, which they I'm pretty sure that they will, uh, if they expand that perhaps to Odessa, I mean I think that would that would be the best case scenario for Russia. But I have no idea what the Kremlin is actually thinking. At the end of the day, if whatever is left of Ukraine is either uh, the best the best case scenario for Russia would be a neutral government in whatever is left of Ukraine. That obviously. Uh, but barring that, if whatever was left was, in, say, incorporated into, say, Poland, Romania, or whatever, um, you're sh you, now now what's left of Ukraine doesn't exist. There is no buffer in between that can be militarized and used as a battering ram against you. If whatever is left uh, is used against Russia, then that is a direct conflict between NATO and Russia, which I think NATO would hesitate uh, provoking. I mean, yeah. think. If they wanted to, they could have just waged a war directly with Russia. I don't think it would have went well, but they could have done that. But they decided to do this proxy war because they had Ukraine. So this is the process of eliminating Ukraine as a potential battering ram against Russia. The best way to do that, I really don't know. A, a regime change, taking all of Ukraine, giving half of, you know, giving parts of the West to different NATO members and then it being part of NATO and then having the obligations of Article 5. And, and the only them. reason I say give them away is because I don't particularly think Russia wants to deal with that no. part of the country. No, probably. That's not Russian. That's not, you know, that's, it can be somebody else's problem because I don't know. it will be a if, problem. I don't even know it if it's going to be, a, be a, I don't, I don't think it's going to be, it's going to work that easy for Poland. I mean, those yeah. are their historical lands, but those people are, Brain definitely washed. separate Big from time. Yeah. Polish. Yeah. So I think that there could be opportunity for Russia there in that sort of negotiated settlement. Um, and then on de-dollarization, uh, did you have you seen the recent statements uh, that Kirby made? I think it was Kirby to uh, MBS recently. I, I didn't see that. I, I did see uh, U.S. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken trying to um, improve relations with Saudi Arabia by lecturing them on. That, that, that was it. That was it. It was Blinken. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. He was talking. Yeah. He uh, that he brought I'm up sure that softened in issues. Riyadh right up. Yeah. That softened Riyadh right up and made them want to jump right back in, in bed with the U.S. Uh, being lectured. It's, you know, this, the U.S. can't help themselves. They have, they have nothing else. What else does the U.S., honestly, what does the U.S. have to offer except lecturing, threatening, and coercing? That's, the, the, these are the only tool sets that they have. If they're going to solve a problem, they have to use these tools. Do they have no other tools? So I, I was just having a, a, a live stream with Li Jingjing from CGTN. And she's Chinese. She grew up in China. She's, she sees the positive things China's doing within their borders and around the world, physically building infrastructure for other nations that they haven't had for generations. Uh, how can the West compete against that? They they cannot. They cannot. What can they use to win back over these nations that are looking for exits? Nothing. And uh, so what is, what is Anthony Blinken going to do when he gets to Saudi Arabia? What could he possibly do other than lecture them? I, I honestly don't know. He can't even lie to them and say, "Well, we'll we'll build this and that and that," because everyone would know that it's a lie. It's it's a so, non-starter. So, are, are, do is it's pretty agreed upon. I think Saudi Arabia is lost. I think that the U.S. has lost that uh, I, ally. I guess you would call it. Um, I I don't see while MBS is while Biden is in power. I don't see MBS ever siding with the U.S. on anything which i don't blame i mean saudi arabia should be about saudi arabia first right and not what the u.s wants and if that means oil cut productions because i'm sure that's what the conversation was about um was the uh saudi announcement that they're going to uh further reduce their oil production which affects they didn't they announce that, that that they were going to do that and then now you have blinken in saudi arabia and he's lecturing them which means what that's what he's doing uh, overtly what is he doing privately he's probably th threatening them he's probably like yeah. this is a really nice palace i would hate to see something happen to it yeah. um we've got this uh stack from the floor to the ceiling all these human rights violations we are turning a blind eye to Maybe some of this might start getting out. I mean, that's what they do. It's like a, it's like the mafia on a on a global scale. It is, it is literally the mafia. <laughs> yes, yes.
Uh, how it and, is. and how bad is it that you supported them for all those years while all of those human rights violations were going on? You just it were sitting right, on this list. Yeah, it goes right back to, oh, we knew Ukraine was going to do Nord Stream, but then we didn't do anything about it. You're just making it worse. You're you're, you're undermining your credibility even more now it's, than if it, you just pretended you didn't know. It's the most short-sighted and... It's it's like there's like this high level of immaturity. It's it's crazy. I've never I've never thought that, you know, I'm I'm young, so I've I never really saw politics before 2000, you know. Uh, but I just never thought the political the US foreign policy would look like this. And you know, it when I go back and I now I look at it through a different historical lens, the US has always done this. This has always been their their way of doing this. It's just now we don't have the influence that we used to have and the power that we used to have to dominate the rest of the world. So people are saying no to us now and we look like idiots. Yeah. Going back to the mafia analogy, I mean, just think about the mafia. The mafia has no need for finesse. They have no need to to understand how to balance and win win and negotiating. They just they're ruthless and they use brute force. But just like you say, as as America continues, that that brute force is not as effective anymore. They haven't developed the other tools necessary to actually deal with other nations, persuade them, uh, uh, negotiate with them. They haven't developed that. That takes a lot of time. You have to have certain capabilities in order to do that because you have to have tangible things to offer them that the U.S. no longer has the ability to offer. So uh, they've neglected. It's just like the, the conflict in Ukraine. When you really think about it, for 20 years plus, they were building their military and gearing it toward these small wars. Now they're in a large scale war of attrition, completely unprepared for it. They know that they're unprepared for it. They're attempting to make changes, but these changes can take years. They don't have years. Same goes for the the whole geopolitical situation and their brand of diplomacy. If you could even call it diplomacy, they 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 need a different form of diplomacy. They don't have the capabilities to to wield it right now, and they won't in the near or intermediate future. Yeah, it's just it needs to change. That that's the that's the only that's the only thing that I can say. It's I I don't see how it can adapt or become better. I ju- it just needs to change. And the administration change. needs to change. The leadership needs to change yeah. because this is just it's not working. And yes. I think everybody I, on the, in the world stage can see that it's not working. Yeah, and and as I say all the time, and I'll continue saying it, uh, the United States and the West, its Western allies, they need to find a constructive role to play among the the nations of the world rather than imposing themselves upon the nations of the world. And as soon as they can understand that, they can start developing the institutions and the the industrial and economic capabilities needed to actually play a constructive role in the world. Right now, they're, they're incapable of this. And it's sad, it's a shame, because if you understand American history, there was a point where they were an industrial powerhouse, and they did have tangible things to offer the world that's no longer the case. That That's something that needs to change. That's a lot of hard work, and that's a lot of years to to turn that around. And right now, there's not even a, a shadow of a hope of anyone involved in U.S. politics that's even qualified to do this, let alone in any sort of position where they might be able to do this. Just I, 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 for a long time, said that it, it, it looked like nobody in Britain could lead. And I still say that it, they yes, they have no one can they have absolutely nobody and they keep cycling through and trying even you know even the opposing party can't produce a candidate that is better than the current candidates that are on the uh, you know on the um, conservative side that aren't doing their job either um, but the U S is just as bad I I am yes. I've been so disappointed in how over a year and a half we've had so few voices talking about what me and you have talked about this entire time just reality not you know anti-american not um you know there 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 is arguments for us supporting ukraine whatever but just minor doses of reality like hey maybe we shouldn't be doing this and there are almost no voices saying that it's a it's a bipartisan agreement that this thing is going to continue and it's it's very disheartening to say the least. 
Yeah, and, and Scott, not not to uh, uh, stretch this out in a different direction, but at the exact same time that this whole Ukraine situation is taking place, they're they're doing the exact same thing in parallel here in Asia with uh, the Chinese island province of Taiwan uh, encircling China with uh, U.S. client regimes across Southeast Asia. The, the like I like I've been saying yeah. often now here, the elections in Thailand, the U.S. Back uh, opposition, they won the elections, so we have to wait to see if if they're able to form a government. And they're already talking about doing all of these things that we see Eastern Europe do, this uh, self destructive, uh, irrational process of cutting themselves off from Russia, and uh, just for the sake of Washington wrecking all of Europe. This, now the same process is in play here in in Asia. So they're doing something unsustainable in Europe, and they're doing the same thing in parallel here in Asia. It's, it's unbelievable. It's unsustainable. And uh, it's, you know, I, it's 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 hard to watch because we know it's, it's not going to end well. There's no yeah. way for it to end well. Literally no possible way. There's no I've, way. I, I have never had an understanding of not wanting a pragmatic relationship with your larger neighbor that's right beside you. At, ever. It's, what what is the U.S. going to do for you across the Pacific Ocean? Nothing. What is Nothing. the U.S. going to do for you across the Atlantic? Nothing. They're, yeah. If you get in trouble, they're not going to be there for you. It's it's you're done. So I've never, yeah, I've never understood that. And yeah, I, I I'm I'm sorry that that's happening in your country. That's unfortunate. Yeah. But this is the reason they put a client regime into power in the first place, because no rational government, no matter how corrupt or incompetent they are, they will never make a decision like, uh, you know, say Ukraine cutting itself off from Russia, because the, the the government before the 2014 coup, they, they were not the greatest government, but they were doing business with Russia, they were doing business with Europe, and it was it was there was some sort of status quo there and a certain form of stability that's gone. That's all gone. And that's the same thing that, that is uh, threatening to happen here in, in Asia. So yeah, it doesn't make sense. It makes so little sense. That is the reason they have to overthrow a, a government and rearrange the institutions to make it happen. Otherwise no, no one in their right mind would do it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think that's where we'll end it today. That's a, that's a good stopping point. Yes, Man, we, we covered went around the whole, yeah, we, we covered everything in this one. Um, Brian, Tell everybody what you got going on, where they can find you. Just go ahead and sell yourself right now. Okay. Well, just go go on YouTube, type in the new Atlas. Uh, and, and in the video description of, of every video is all the other places you can find and follow me on Twitter, Telegram, everywhere else. Thank you, Scott, so much for having me on. It's uh, I think it's much better doing the video. Yeah, I like uh, it. So I'm glad that you're doing that. And um, uh, yeah, we'll, I look forward to being on again in the near future. Yeah, guys, please, seriously, take this advice to heart. Go follow Brian. I watch his videos the second they come out. I add them into my analysis. He does great work. He shows his work, too. A lot of guys don't do that. He is the... Uh, it takes a lot of extra time. Yeah, it that. is. I, I, bar yeah. I barely do it for my videos, and it is like an extra two hours of work. So if you guys want in-depth, solid analysis, go follow Brian. Thank you guys so much for listening today. If you don't mind liking and subscribing on this video, go and subscribe to Brian's page. And you know what? Take care of yourselves and have a great week.